Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome back Gail Fugit. Thank you. Uh, really fun morning and interesting and happy to have everyone here. But what would be uh, greater than hearing presentations than to stir up some controversy with a debate? And to be clear, this is not a panel discussion that we're calling a debate. This is actually going to be a debate. Uh, and who better to lead a debate than our very own Dave Morgan? Uh, Dave is the CEO of Simul Media. He's an ARF board member, an advertising strategist extraordinaire, and he's uh, curated a very timely debate and a great group of people to join him. He's uh, currently the chief executive officer and founder of Simul Media. A number of his team members are here. He previously uh, founded and ran Takoda, an online ad company that pioneered behavioral online marketing as well as Real Media Inc., one of the world's first ad-serving and online ad network companies. Uh, so he's no stranger to the topics that we're talking about today. In fact, he's been one of the industry leaders in that area. Uh, he also served as an EVP of Global Advertising Strategy at AOL. Um, I would personally say he's, uh, he's just a very uh, well-read, well-spoken, provocative, interesting, uh, fun person who knows just about everybody. And uh, he's going to amplify our uh, discussion this morning on programmatic buying by uh, bringing out his assembled who's who. Uh, so please join me in welcoming and thanking Dave Morgan. Mm -hmm. Okay, you can start the first clock. Everything is gonna be on the clock today in case you get frustrated uh, about uh, sessions that, uh, that aren't, that aren't well-timed. So uh, you can start that first minute while I'm gonna introduce our panelists, um, our debaters. We have Lauren Wiener, of, president of Tremor Video. We have Sean Downey of Google. We have Adam Gerber of ABC TV. And we have Tim Spangler, President of Content Marketing Strategy at Clear Channel Entertainment. I was trying to get the longest title in there. We are, you're hearing an awful lot of discussion these days about programmatic advertising, and a lot of people think it's going to swallow TV. So we have a resolution today which the panelists are going to debate. Resolved, by 2020, the majority of all video advertising in the U.S will be bought and sold programmatically. One team is gonna argue in the affirmative, one team is gonna argue in the negative, they're gonna to get to ask each other questions, and so, just got my intro in time, and Lauren Wiener is gonna be the one to lead off first. So, we're now gonna look for the two minute clock, and we're gonna keep everybody tight on time, and this is gonna be like the panel where it's all one topic the whole time. So, the two minute clock, please, if we could see that. Lauren, start off. So first I want to start off by defining what programmatic is because there's a lot of confusion in the industry. Programmatic is the automation of the buying and the planning process. Yes, real-time bidding is a subsection of it, but it is one subsection. It is not the definition of what programmatic is. And second, I'd like to look at other industries that have gone programmatic over time. If you take travel or finance, for example, where you have major, uh, you have the NASDAQ, you have Orbitz, you have Priceline. These are the kinds of industries where when they w first went programmatic, it was the early adapters, the people who were, had a little less to lose, um, that were f willing to jump in at first. And so they started with Remnant and then they went up the food chain uh, to more premium programmatic. So that now you're seeing very expensive hotel rooms trade on travel sites. Mm. And ultimately, the reason that programmatic makes great economic sense is that it frees up human capital to work on the more important creative tasks, the things that can't be automated. So after looking at programmatic, let's define what the video market is. Four years ago, it was only 1.4 billion. It was pretty nascent. Today, it's about 6 billion. And the forecast is that it's going to be 12 billion in the next four years. So it is a very fast growing space. Um, second, let's talk about what's happening in that market as consumers are watching across all different screens. In Mary Meeker's latest report, she said that 57% of adults, only 57%, are watching TV live. 
Think about in 1950, that was clearly 100%. And if you look at millennials, who are now in the 16 to 34 bracket, depending on how you define them, 41% um, of those are watching live. So a lot of them are watching through digital formats. And a Forrester report estimated that 25% of programmatic buying. OK. <clears throat> we'll be programmatic. <laughs> Adam Gerber, ABC TV. I've been doing this for a long time. This is classic. I've never had a buzzer Okay. Wow. All right. We so, want to hear uh, from the people that don't believe it's going to go pro the majority will go programmatic. Please okay. start the clock. So uh, let, me, let me start by saying I don't agree with the answer of yes or no in this question from the start. I don't think you can answer it that way. So I'm taking the side of no, but I'm not really a true no. Um, <laughs> look, <laughs> the, uh, Are you conceding so quickly? <laughs> not conceding. I'm, I'm, I'm positioning. I'm setting myself up. Listen, the, the first question that you have to do is define programmatic. And uh, Lauren attempted to do that. I, while I agree that you have to define it and there are different parts to it, I don't agree with necessarily the assessment she made. In our view, there are three different things that everyone is referring to as programmatic. The first is plain and simple automation of the current business models and back-end systems of the TV business and the digital video business. That's automation. The second thing is data application. Where can I apply new data streams, new sets of targeting data into the transaction process to create value for advertisers. The third is real-time bidding, open exchange environments, where you're essentially creating the ability of a buyer to cherry pick inventory based on data um, in a real-time situation. There are three different drivers of those three different solutions. The first is really all about creating less workflow and streamlining the process. Both buyers and sellers want that. There shouldn't be friction in getting it done. The second thing, data application, it's really about strategic partnerships. How can sellers provide more value to buyers? The third is really about supply and demand. When you have too much supply, there have to be better forms and, and liquidity solutions to move that market. I've got 17 seconds left. I think the other two big issues are how do you define the TV market? When you talk about trading everything, is it units, GRPs, or dollars? And I think at the end of the day, the linear TV marketplace has lots of components to it that will never be able to be automated. Sponsorships, brand integrations, all sorts of okay. components like that. <laughs> John, the man leading the management of probably the, the largest scale digital ad technology stack in the world, what makes you an affirmative of this position? So it's all about, to me. Start the clock, please. Uh, let's get the clock. It's the audience. You have to go where the audiences are. Audiences are moving online, especially the younger audiences, as Lauren said. This year, the paid TV industry as a whole lost subscribers for the first time. At the same time, people spending more time with their tablets, smartphones, computers, and over 50% of internet daily viewership is 18 to 34 years old. So if we talk about 2020, the main demographic is going to be an online-centric user base. What does that mean for advertisers? It has implications. It means as mass marketers who have massive investments in TV, that dwarf online spend today, they have to start moving to where those users are so they can get their content, get their message, and their future business depends on reaching their customers on their terms from that perspective. And there are really three things that we think drive why this world changes. The first is that's the end of going online. Today we go online because we have to get there. To, as we move in the future with all the fragmented devices, you're just online because you are. You have mobile t tablets, you have phones, you have computers, and it's part of your daily experience. It's also gotten more personal. People aren't looking for mass content consumption on a clock. They're looking for it on their terms with content that's interesting to them from that standpoint. Uh, and the third is that video is really starting to enter the fourth dimension. By that, I mean sight, sound, motion, and interaction become really important from that standpoint. Um, YouTube this year did their upfront event broadcast where they uh, showcased publishers and content creators that understood about user interaction being very important. They create personal connections with millions of fans and deliver better viewership than most cable networks. That's a true sign. That's where audiences go from that standpoint. Programmatic comes into play because we, start to, we have to make sure we leverage the scale of TV that doesn't exist in online today. And we do believe that we can do that. We think we can get better targeting, better measurement, and a better canvas if we're starting to get user-centric creative from that standpoint. So I think as we move forward in the, in the industry, we can start to figure out which inventory is the best. We can start to figure out what data is actionable, as Adam said. And we can certainly figure out what's that shift for consumers and focus on really user-first experiences. Perfect. He nailed it right on time. Tim Spangler, you ran Initiative. 
Magna Global, now on the sell side. Start the clock. I'd like to first start by defining programmatic. Okay, just kidding. <laughs> um, <laughs> inevitably, we'll use more data and technology, so inevitably more and more things will be programmatic. But I, I, see, I just see a bifurcation between data plays and content and context plays and experience plays. Advertisers are not going to play Moneyball with 1,000% of their money. They're going to create experiences. They're not going to sit and wait for someone to respond to a banner ad or a video ad. We, don't, we can't even count them. Half the impressions are wasted in a, video, in a video ad today. We don't even know what we're measuring, how many people we're paying in between to brand to, to uh, content provider. And so I think as advertisers take more hold of that and look to create more experiences in combination with better targeting, that you're going to see you're not going to see 100% of all advertising go programmatic. And if you do, and those brands that do, I think if, they get, if it all gets swallowed up by programmatic, it's going to get spit out pretty quick because it's not going to work. It's not going to be as effective. And uh, that's kind of what I wanted to say. There you go. <laughs> you give some time back. We like that. Two minutes. So you can, you can start and reset, and, and we'll reset the clock in a second. We're now going to go into the most fun part of it. That was just a little bit of the warm up. Every debater is going to have two minutes of time to cross examine the debaters on the other team. And uh, you can use that time as you want. If they're getting too slow and, and are not, and being unresponsive, please call them out on it. And if need be, I'll step in to keep the, uh, to keep the answers moving. So if we could. Lauren, if you could start, and we'll start the clock again with two minutes. Okay. Tim, I'm going to start with you. You mentioned waste viewability as an issue in online. What do you call it in TV where somebody has their set-top box running, you think they're seeing commercials, but they're not? Or TV's running, commercials running, but there's no eyeballs on it because the person's in the bathroom or on a mobile device? I think there's imperfection in all measurement. I just think there's a lot more imperfection in dig digital video measurement than there is in traditional TV measurement or traditional radio measurement. <laughs> yeah, see, I would argue that there's actually a lot that, more. Questions, oh. please, questions. Oh, that's sorry. <laughs> Cross-examination questions. Well, what, what's wrong with a comeback? I don't see what's wrong with that. That's, we, we have structured debate format oh, we here. Do? So, oh, yeah. OK, I'm going to hold my comeback <laughs> for now and then. <laughs> questions. OK, Adam. You said that you're defining it. Now, ABC recently announced uh, they were going programmatic. So in what sort of definition and fashion is ABC going programmatic, and what part of the market are they embracing as part of your definition? So actually, the announcement was very clear. Thank you for asking about it. Uh, we specifically said what we are not doing. What we are not doing is uh, moving into an RTB environment. We're not enabling any of our inventory to flow into open exchanges. And none of our linear broadcast uh, inventory is part of the trial. The trial is really intended to try to create a process by which advertisers can apply first or third party data to our digital video inventory in a more sophisticated way so that they can target in real time and not buy based on age and sex demographics. We want to help our clients better deliver the customer segments that they want to reach and the way that you do that is by connecting their key data with our ad server. But in order to actually run a business, you have to be able to forecast how much of that inventory you have to sell so that you can actually propose to the advertiser what they might be able to buy. And, uh, and the trial is all about facilitating that through the so That is in your definition programmatic. So Adam, <coughs> you now have two minutes of questions for the affirmative team. Start the clock. So I guess you know my first question is going to tie back to our linear business, and I, I just ask how how you would how you would um, propose that automated programmatic buying and selling support the TV business, much of which is driven by sponsorships, by brand integrations. Those are all models that require unit-based commitments to shows, where advertisers have to have a placement in the show where impressions are not dynamically ad served. How does programmatic support TV when that inevitably will main, be maintained as the basis for how those, uh, those kind of sponsorships are sold? Were you asking? Lawrence. You, 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 you can take that one. Go ahead. 
I'll, I'll, I'll happy to answer that one. So I, I think all negotiations between advertisers and publishers should happen with a total view of what's happening from that standpoint. So one of the principles that we have at Google is that if you're doing upfront negotiations or sponsorship negotiations, which are critical to your brand, you should start to figure out what is all the occurrences that you're going to exchange in that environment. Uh, we think video itself lends itself to high premium programmatic marketplaces, which means one-to-one -one relationships between an advertiser and a publisher. So if you want to do a large sponsorship deal with Procter & Gamble, for example, and they want to have a lot of TV environment, they're ultimately trying to fill out their buy with some of your online activities. With technology today, you can certainly allocate inventory to them and let them start to leverage the data points that you've referenced, let them start to leverage the audience targets that they're referencing, and have an exchange of your inventory in a one-to-one -one environment. We're not speaking about going open auction for everyone and having you know, every advertiser having their dibs on your inventory, but get your best stuff, prioritize to your best and biggest customers, and let them have the best value of the impressions that go in their total sponsorship. Yeah, and again, back to your original definition. So RTB being one segment, but this programmatic reserve being the other segment that Sean's referring to. And the reason we think it's going to go programmatic is exactly what you said. There's no reason that they shouldn't be able to lay our data on top of sponsorship. OK. Sean, you've got two minutes to answer, cross-examine the negative team. If we could start the clock, please. So Adam, I, I'm interested in uh, your data connections point, because I think data is really important for advertisers. Um, and you referenced them going into your ad server. How do you scale that? Um, is it m that much better to have a more you know, open solution where you can have lots of advertisers plug in with data sets? Like, what's your vision for helping those advertisers get their data into your system? Well, our vision is, is you know, first a vision about trialing different solutions in the marketplace, and that's what we announced last week with Freewheel, which is the ad server for us and a number of other major networks in the industry. Um, they have created a, a solution that allows a, a client's data to be imported into a safe harbor environment, so that data can be accessed by whatever seller is choosing to negotiate or trade on that, on that segment, um, so that we can forecast inventory, and, and I think that's completely aligned with your way of thinking, which is that there's a center hub through which buyers and sellers can transact based on data, and they have to scale. And the best place to scale that is with the ad serving platforms that are servicing most of the major publishers in the video marketplace. Yep. Tim, I apologize in advance for this question. Um, you <laughs> oh. came from a company who publicly stated at, at Magna Global that 50% of their buying should be programmatic, and they meant TV as well. Why are you on the other side of the debate now? <laughs> What do you mean? Uh, <laughs> <laughs> look, I, I think we at IPG were driving to an automated solution using data and technology to 50%. The debate here is, is it going to be 100% in six years? I say no. It will not be 100% in six years. Should the industry automate? Should the industry kind of evolve from the legacy systems and, and spreadsheets that don't connect and phones and faxes? Yes. Should it go all the way? I'd say no. And I think you guys are, I, I hear you guys are saying more yes. And I'm saying no, it's not going to go all the way. 50% is one number. And three years was really, really a lofty goal. Now we're talking six years, I get it. But OK, Tim, <laughs> you're now the cross-examiner. You have two minutes to ask questions. Yeah, so I'll, I'll just continue along that line. So I, you have to ask a question. You can't just keep... Oh, that's true. I do. OK. So I'll ask it like Jeopardy. I'll ask it in the form of a question. It'll be a statement. But, so um, how, how do you guys, either one, think that the media owners who, can, who make content and then have to sell it, so start with, yeah, you, it takes a buyer and a seller, but you make content. Why am I, as a media owner, going to automate every single aspect of my business when I don't have to, when I don't have enough supply to even sell to the people who want it, which is why the price goes up each year. And, why, and, and the reason more people want it than I have is because the value of it is proven to be there for marketers why they keep coming back. So why would I automate, why would I go to programmatic and, go to, and, and, and lose control over my programming my assets if I don't have to? Why, why is that going to occur in the next six years? Yeah, well, first of all, I, I would say that you don't need to lose control over your assets. Again, there's that RTB aspect to it where you're just putting in the, and seeing what price you get, and there's the programmatic reserve. And I, none of us, I think, are suggesting that linear TV with the coveted sponsorships that it has is going to go RTB. 
But I do think that going programmatic reserve is just a very efficient way to give advertisers who want to market in a digital age, not just right. do digital, but to market in a digital age, give them what they want, which is the premium content and context of these great sponsorships, but the ability to layer on their own first party data that they have stored in DMPs on top of that. And so why the TV companies are going to do it is because it's what the advertisers want. Yeah, so I, get, I guess I get that for Sean, Sean's example of P&G buys a parcel of inventory and then they decision it it's their a question. own way. It's a question. But what I don't understand is how you think the experiences that are going to be co-created by brands are going to be done in an, in an ultimate automated programmatic way when you're going to start when brands and content companies are going to get together. So <clears throat> the judge gets two minutes of questions. <clears throat> Um, and uh, about that was that 11th two minute yes. one we just added. Forgot in. that part. Um, <laughs> so if you could, uh, if you could start the clock, um, Lauren, do you think that Mary Meeker number that less than 60 percent of American adults watch television live is really true? I think she's a pretty damn good analyst. So I would say yes. <laughs> okay. Just wonder if it's realistic. I'm looking at Mr. David Poltrack down here, and I suspect he might say it's a little bit different. But. Um, Clearly, the sell side, we've heard that the buy side has said that they want to buy this way. I guess they have control because, do they have control in the linear TV world as they've had in the digital world? And either of you can take that. I don't think this needs to be positioned as a world of who has control. I think this has to be positioned as a world of where can we create mutual benefit. <coughs> and um, there are a lot of ways that in the linear TV world, you can create benefit for an advertiser by applying new forms of data. That doesn't mean that you have to do it with a programmatic solution. Look, I, I, I like hearing the fact that you, you talk about taking a sponsorship and allowing someone to programmatically decision advertising into linear TV. When you actually explore how you do that, you can't do it. There's, there's an MVPD in the middle who controls access to the home. So it's just yeah. not something that's easily yeah. done. Yeah. So Sean, one of the points that Tim made before was the importance of investment. TV companies will spend $35 billion this year on new programming. How do you think in a programmatic world you can give them the assurance to bet on content that won't even be available for a year? Well, I think content comes from many places. So I think there's the investment from the major companies who are putting content out there. I think there's also a world where there's lots more user content generated or small publisher content generated. So you imagine actually the 35 billion may be displaced or supplanted by well, I think single it, digit I think million, it evolves. Billion. I think we're going to end up in a world where there's lots more content than there is today. We, we live in a digital, a golden age of content for many ways. Right, so there's our traditional players. And then there's all these niche players that are producing tremendous content that have a tremendous viewership. Great. So now. We're getting to our, our conclusion. And before we start the conclusion, um, we are going to have some voting. There's not really any winners or losers. But <laughs> we're going to have voting. And you vote by Twitter. And you use the hashtag ARFAM14, which is here. And you can uh, make your vote. And it can be a vote of abstention. It can be a vote for both. But before we do that, each side is going to get a, and we're not going to tally up the results till later. And maybe Jeffrey Graham will tell us the answer. But we're going to have two minutes available to the affirmative to sh be shared, and then a two minute clock available to the ne negative to be shared. So um, are we ready, affirmative? Yeah, you go ahead. Okay. There's huddle moments. Huddle moments going on. It's OK. We ready? All right. OK, you can start the clock. OK. So let's look at 2020. The oldest millennials are going to be 40 years old. Those are the ones that are largely watching, time shifted. When they say they're watching TV, they might be watching on an iPad. They might be watching on Roku. They might be watching on a desktop. They might be watching on regular TV, but they have fundamentally different consumer behaviors. And so that makes it ripe for programmatic from a consumer standpoint, number one. Number two. Let's look at the advertisers that we all look at, the harbingers of TV spend. P&G announced digital spend will be 70% programmatic in 2014. So that is not just digital, but that is also video. That's a big harbinger. Kellogg's and Ford are right up there, and IPG has been leading the way uh, with automation. So the, the advertisers follow the consumers. The consumers are already there, and by the broad definition of programmatic is the automation of buying and planning. It is clearly going to be there by 2020. Right, so I'd go with three closing points. Uh, one is the marketers do want to go where their users are. So if they're going online, they're going to start to advertise more online. Measurement is making that easier to figure out who saw something, 
was it viewable, and what's the uplift of those areas. We're starting to get tangible measurements that are similar to the role of TV metrics, which are important. Uh, and then finally, the goal here is to develop win-wins between publishers and advertisers. And I think that comes in multiple areas. In an area where content is becoming more personal, there's a huge opportunity to extend relationships between publishers and marketers and have digital first campaigns and extension of uh, campaign you know, creative. There's also an infusion of the data that Adam's talking about that has the opportunity to actually raise CPMs because we can start to get better experiences on better inventory, and if we can start to use better creative with better data, you might see a $5 CPM go to $8 or a 20 go to 30 if it works better for the advertisers. There's, there's a lot of pros for both sides, and I think those areas alone are going to start to drive us into a more programmatic world than there was before because we have to remove all the inefficiencies of, of you know, fax machines and trading calls. Yeah, you know, I don't think we disagree with anything you guys are saying. And generally, Start the clock. Generally, we're in the right direction. I guess the debate is around what year and how much. And we just don't agree. You know, it's real easy for someone who doesn't, no offense, but make content. But we sit back here making content either for custom, either for the marketplace or for our clients and with our clients. And there's just no way we're going to decision out those experiences because we sit on the right brain side of this, of this da dais and there is still going to be creativity. The last I looked, advertising, communications, all of that is around art and science. You go too far in science, it's going to swing back the other way. For the marketers, not just for the media companies, but for the marketers, you, you can decision yourself right into a niche and you're going to, you're going to sell to fewer people. And so I just think, I, I think our point of view is that we hear you, digital lens, if everything's moving <coughs> more and more in that direction, you're just never going to get to 100%. Yeah, and I would, just, I would just say, look, to us, automation is not programmatic. Automation is something we've been trying to do in this business since I got into it in 1992, and we still haven't gotten very far. We still send faxes and emails back and forth for linear TV deals, moving units around. It's, it's absurd. Um, but automation is not programmatic. Programmatic is about applying data in real time to dynamic inventory so that you can decision and add against the right user at the right time. And I do not believe exactly what Tim said. I, while I agree with the general kind of underlying premise that more and more of the video eco ecosystem will move there, it's not going to be 100% by 2020. There are large swaths of our business that are going to remain driven by human to human contact, ideation, big ideas, and quite honestly, as more and more focus is placed on live events and sports as key reach builders, you know, those are not going to be sold in a programmatic environment. Just not going to happen. Um, so I think a huge component of the TV business on a ratings basis is driven by those types of shows. So absolutely not 100% of the business by 2020. OK. Um, you're all going to get to determine um, who you think the winners and the losers are. I hope under any circumstance you recognize we've all won by having this debate and having this discussion. This is a topic that we're going to hear a lot more about. It's a topic that sometimes happens in a vacuum or happens in press releases. Everybody here is living in the trenches of this. And, um, and I really want to thank <clears throat> Lauren and Sean and Adam and Tim for participating in this, taking a risk. Um, I, purposefully didn't prep them as much so we could sort of keep it a little bit of a higher energy debate. And uh, I, really, I really thank you all for, uh, for being part of this and helping advance this topic forward. And don't forget to tweet um, who, you think, who you think won, whether both win, no one, no wins, or we all win, uh, to um, hashtag ARFAM14.